God has your answer today. Amen. Today we're continuing our study on who is Jesus. And the title of this specific message today, Jesus said of himself, I am the resurrection and the life. My scripture text can be found in John chapter 11, verse 25. And we're going to be studying ch John chapter 11 today. We're going to be bouncing through those verses. But John chapter 11, verse 25 is, is my main focus verse and this is Jesus talking, and I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And Jesus is talking to Martha, uh, the sister of Lazarus, the man in this story who had been dead now for four days. And Jesus spoke to Martha and said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Now, as we get into our message, uh, there are a few things that I want to point out. Now, there are some folks, they, they, they ground their ministry around the concept of biblical numerics. Has anyone ever heard of that before? Biblical numerics, where each number in the Bible represents some theological significance. Well, I just want to, it's just a fun fact, if you will, just point out something that stood out to me as I was doing my study, and then I'm going to get into my message, because it does somewhat tie to my message today. And uh, as we look at it, Saint number one, Saint John, the book of John, that fourth gospel. We, we see in the book of St. John, it's the only gospel that has what they call the seven I am statements of Jesus. The seven I am statements of Jesus. Uh, another piece of trivia about this book of John that John also wrote, and we call it the seven signs of Jesus. And, and John, as we read those, would see that John allowed this to be because it is the seven signs that point everyone to see that Jesus is not only the Son of God, but He is God. And so we see seven I am's. We see the seven signs that prove Jesus is God, starting with, and, and in that John chapter 2, it says this was the first of the signs. It was turning the water into wine. The second one was healing the royal official son in John 4. Third, healing the paralytic at Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda in John 5. Then we read last week, uh, right close to John 6, about feeding the 5,000, the miracle there. And then in John 6, Jesus also walks on water. In John chapter 9, Jesus healed a blind man who had been blind from his birth. And now in John chapter 11, the seventh sign is Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Now they didn't give us another sign in the book of John, but if we were to label sign number eight in the book of John, sign number eight in the book of John is Jesus being resurrected himself. Jesus being resurrected himself. But as we talk about biblical numerics and the number seven, seven is the number of what some say means completedness and perfection. On the day seven, God took his rest because he saw all that he had created and he saw that it was very good. And so God took rest because his work was complete. It was perfect. Number seven not only talks about physical perfection and completeness, but also uh, signifies spiritual completion and perfection as well. It derives much of its meaning from being tied directly to God's creation of all things. God's not a God of destruction, though his judgment does bring destruction, but judgment and destruction comes only to those who do not live and honor God. If we live and honor God, we don't have to be afraid of, of a hand of judgment, we can live freely, walk freely, act freely in the love and the power of this loving God that cares for us so much. Amen? 
So as a side note, that eighth sign considered to be Jesus raising from the dead, the number eight also represents a new beginning. It represents a, a new order. It represents a new creation. It represents a new being born again. So it's important, unlike a, a friend of ours who uh, some years back had gone to college and he got much learning and his learning, he came back, he said it didn't matter whether whether Jesus had arisen from the dead or not, as long as we knew that he was crucified. But see, here's the thing, rising from the dead, and the book of John will be the eighth, the eighth sign that he is the son of God. It's important for us to know that he did rise from the dead. Jensen Franklin said, if you can't believe in the resurrection, you sure can't believe in the rapture of the church. And I want to believe in his resurrection because I don't know about you, but just like Amazing Grace, the song says, I was blind, but now I see I was lost lost but now I'm found. I was in a place where I couldn't help myself but Jesus came to me when I could not come to where he was. He rescued me and he rescued you as well. Would you give him praise this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Now Jesus had come to the coast or the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 he says who do men or people say that the Son of Man is? And his disciples said, Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. Still others say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked ask a pointed question. And I believe he's asking all of us today. That's all fine and good, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? See, sometimes we don't know how to articulate that. Maybe because we're not living near him, we don't really know him, so we don't know how to define who he is in our own lives. We know about him. We come to church sometimes on Easter. Maybe I, I remember as a small kid uh, before my mom and dad knew Christ, I, no doubt my grandmother was hammering away at my dad. You need to be in church on Easter. And so we'd all get ready and we'd drag ourselves to church. And sometimes that's how it is. We get here because somebody hounded us till we showed up. We come just so they would quit talking about it and we could get that checkbox and move on. But we really didn't know him and Jesus says, who do you say that I am? So, well, if you don't know, let me tell you. Jesus answered his own question. He says, I am. So who is Jesus? He said, I am. Last week we learned. He said, I am the bread of life. It's so that you and I do not have to hunger and thirst spiritually again. I said last week that there are those, I believe the young lady that throws herself in the arms of every smooth talking young man looking for love is because there's something missing on the inside that can only be filled with the love and the power of God and, and she's looking for love and so she thinks she's going to find it in that hairy legged smooth talking somebody that needs Jesus. We're going to quit talking about that guy because you know he needs Jesus too. Um, but the, the, the reason a young man will, will uh, shoot someone just to belong in a gang is because they're looking for belonging. They're looking for love and they'll, they'll, they'll steal or kill somebody or join a gang rape just to be be a part of a gang. We talked about that last week. But Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. If you're hungry, come to me. If you're looking, if you're looking for satisfaction, you're not going to find it out there. You're going to find it in me. Today, Jesus says, who is Jesus? I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. So as we look at that, that today, as we think about what Jesus said, there are four things that I want to point out in John chapter 11 that I think that is important. Now, in this story, starting with verse 1, there was a man. His name was Lazarus. The Bible says he was sick. He's from a town called Bethany or a village, and he lived there with Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. It was her brother that was sick. And the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. And so we find in this verse of scripture, he's got a friend. They even testified he loves this friend. This friend is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through him. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. 
So when he heard he was sick, listen, I underlined this in my Bible. He stayed two more days in the place where he was. They needed Jesus. They sent for him. And the Bible says once he found out this information, he stayed two more days where he was. The point that I want to bring out today right now with that one verse is this. The Lord's delay is not his denial. The Lord's delay is not his denial. And here's what I'm talking about. Just because Jesus was delaying his approach, his appearance, his coming on the scene and intervening in this dire situation doesn't mean he was sending a message of no. Often there are delays between our times of prayer and the answers from God. We could take a poll that there have been times in our lives, Sister Annie, that we've prayed and we've asked God for specific things. And when we prayed and they didn't happen, we immediately began to doubt God. We immediately began to give up, throw in the towel. E either we started questioning God or we started questioning our own faith. Well, God just doesn't hear me, I guess. God doesn't care. We start doubting him. We get angry with God. But Christ's delay is not his denial. His delay means he is working to take us to a new place in our faith that if he come immediately, our faith wouldn't be built up to that new place. I believe it was T.D. Jakes that said, you'll never know that you've got faith until you've been in a good fight. If things are always easy and always smooth and nothing ever goes wrong and we never have arthritic pains in our legs and we never wake up with a migraine or we never have falls that bust us up or we never have these difficult times or lose loved ones, if we never have those times that challenge our faith, we would never know that there is another level in God we can have, that there's another peace in Jesus that can be had if we can just wait. His, his delay is not a denial. He's got a better place for us. Amen. See, Jesus here, he delayed giving time for more people to gather in order for more to witness the miracle, giving a great number of people the opportunity to believe in him. Let me say that again. He delayed so that more people would gather around the need, gather around the issue, gather around the problem so that when he performed the miracle, more people would see, yes, he is Jesus and I believe in him. Amen. Would you praise him this morning? And Jesus is carrying on conversations with Martha about this incident. And he finally shows up and Martha comes to where he is. And he, he, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And I've heard some preach that, uh, that it was a word of doubt, that it was a word of frustration. It, it, was a, it was a word saying, Jesus, that she was tongue lashing him for not showing up. But I actually believe that it actually is a word of faith because she said, Lord, I know if you'd have been here before he died, you could, have, you could have said the prayer and you could have raised him up from his sickness. However, he died and a little later on in the conversation she says, but Lord, I know Christ, I know you are the Christ, the son of the living God and whatever you ask the father, he'll do it for you and he can even raise him up right now. You read your Bible, it's in there. She had faith. But Jesus delayed his purpose. We see it in verse 4. Here's why. It says this sickness was not to the end of death, but it was for what? It was for the glory of God. Verse 4 tells us that this sickness was for the glory of God, and it's so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Jesus' delay was also to debunk false cultural belief. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, there was a belief that if someone passed away, that their spirit kind of hovered around for about three days. And then on the end of that third day, somewhere about 1159 uh, p.m., just before midnight, and then midnight struck and, and there was nobody to put that spirit back in that body, then the spirit would go on to Sheol or wherever it was going to go. 
And Jesus knew that this was a, a cultural falsehood. Do we have, never mind, we're not going to talk about cultural falsehoods right now. That's not what we're talking about today. Uh, but Jesus wanted to debunk that, so he waited. He purposely waited so that four days had passed. He had been in the grave for four days. They even said he'd been there so long that he's stinking now. He, he, he's, he's smelling really bad. Jesus said, that doesn't bother. It's amazing to me that when we come to Jesus, we come just as I am, as the hymn book would say. So we come to him smelly. We come to him with our hair all messed up. We come to him with all of our warts and struggles and come to him with all of our sins and all of our faults and failures, just like we are broken and crippled. And we drag ourselves to an altar somewhere and, 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 and everyone else around us may look down at us. We may have family that won't even speak to us because of how we are in our, the condition we're in. And we get to where Jesus is. And when we get there, we're expecting somewhat of the same thing. But instead of that, we feel great big arms of love wrap around us. We feel the sense of, of the weight of sin to be lifted off us. And we know that we have been touched by the divine hand of Jesus. That's called being saved, being born again, being delivered from my sin. This is the Jesus I've preached to you today. Would you give him the glory and the honor today? Praise the Lord. The second thing is Jesus will meet you right where you are. His delay is not a denial. He's got a bigger, bigger plan. Secondly, Jesus will meet you right where you are. If I could just share just one part of her testimony. A few weeks ago, Sister Ann had a stumble. She said, within moments of her accident, the Holy Spirit came over her. And he began to speak through her words of comfort and anointing and power. And in the middle of her pain, God became real. God became real to her. We think it's that, that God somehow somewhere on a mountain and if we can somehow drag our dry bleach bones up the side of that hill, maybe some way we can draw a number and wait in line and maybe God will take time out for us. No, he's right there with us in our storm and in our struggle. Jesus will meet you where you are. In John chapter 11, verse 20, the Bible says, As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. She, Martha, went out to meet him, but Mary stayed seated in the house. Now, uh, what we see here is various personalities. Now, Martha had a busy personality. She had to always be doing something. Somebody would say that Martha was ADD, that she needed some Adderall, some Ritalin or something. You look over in, in the next chapter, Jesus had already raised Lazarus from the dead, and he was at their house for dinner. Jesus is sitting, and the picture you get, Lazarus is sitting at the table with Jesus, Mary is, in this chapter 11, she's sitting, and in, in, in chapter 12, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, looking into his face, and she's, she's clinging to every word. We read a while ago that this is the same Mary that came in and anointed Jesus' feet and, and, and wiped her tears off his feet with her own hair. So she enjoyed just sitting and enjoying the presence of Jesus, not Martha. Martha had ADD. Because when you read chapter 12, Martha was in the kitchen and she was beating and banging pots and she was mixing up some buttermilk and some lard and some, some uh, Martha white flour and she was making biscuits for Jesus and she was frying up some pork tenderloin and she was just getting dinner ready and she kept looking through uh, the little opening between the kitchen and the, and, and the dining room and she saw Lazarus just sitting there and she saw Mary just sitting at the feet of Jesus and I'm over here real busy doing all this stuff for Jesus. I'm cooking supper for Jesus. I'm working real hard. And look at all them just sitting around doing nothing. 
You ever run anybody like that? Maybe you work uh, with somebody in the workplace that's like that. You look around. They can't sit down even at break. They're standing up. And they're, they're, they're just. I remember working at a place called Big Star. And I don't know why the lady did this. She'd get two honey buns and then she would buy a Diet Coke. And one day I got brave enough to say, hey, does that kind of cancel out? She didn't answer. She just gave me this look. That meant don't talk to me like that again. <laughs> The, the, the excuse is usually, well, I just like the flavor of Diet Coke. No, you're trying to cancel it out. Martha had a busy personality. And I'm like Martha. I don't have ADD. But I feel like if something's got to be done, it's time to roll the sleeves up, take the coat off, and start doing it. Somebody's got to do it. Uh, you know, I, I was raised by a father, and we, we pastored much, much, much smaller churches. And if a sheetrock needed to be hanged, then me and my brother Billy and Brandon and Faith and Dad, we were hanging the sheetrock. If gas line needed to be run, we were running the gas line. If somebody needed to go under the house to pull electrical wire, they sent me under the house to pull electrical wire because I was always string bean. If somebody needed to go in the attic to, to pull electrical wire, Brother Brandon, I was the one. So I was trained, I was taught, look, if something needs to be done around the house of God, don't be looking for somebody else to do it. Get up and do it. And so from now on, if you come to us and you say, you know what I think? I think a coat closet would be a great thing, Garner Church. That means God just showed you, you need to be the captain of the Garner Church of God coat closet. <laughs> Brother J.D., I think we need to have a food pantry. I'm going to pray and anoint you to be the captain of the food pantry of the Garner Church of God. Because God wants us to be like Martha. Get up and get busy. However, there are times that being a busy personality is important. And here's why. Because when you're struggling, you need a Martha spirit about you. If Jesus is coming by, I'm going to get to where he is. I want to find him. And Martha gets up and she goes to where he is. We read another story in the Bible of a woman who had been sick. She was bleeding out. She had a hemorrhage and it wouldn't stop. And she had gone to doctors for many years and they couldn't do one thing for her. And she was dying from all of this. Her, her Medicare, Medicaid, her insurance had run out. She had kept it out. She had nothing left. She had given everything that she had, yet she grew worse. And she said, I see Jesus coming by and I know there's a big crowd of people around him, but if I can just get to where Jesus is and if I can just scrape the tips of my fingers over the, 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 the hem of his robe then I know I shall be made well and that's exactly what happened there's sometimes we've got to get a Martha spirit about ourselves if we get up out of that, that bed of feeling sorry for ourselves yes it's been tough it's been hard and we may be climbing up the rough side of the mountain but I'm going to keep climbing because I'm going to get to where Jesus is Amen. yes would you praise him this verse, this chapter in chapter 11 says, and Jesus met Martha right where she was. Her busybody self, he met her. He talked to her, carried on conversation. I know if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. I acknowledge from the previous six signs you could have healed my brother. I know you had the power to raise him from his sickness. You can stop death. I think Jesus looked at her and said, Martha, I know you're hurting, but I got a bigger plan. You can't wrap your mind around it yet. 1 Corinthians 2 9 tells us, but eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor entered into the heart of man all the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, those who love him, Jesus said, do you love me? The disciples, yeah, Lord, you know we do. He said, then keep my commandments. To so those that truly love him, they're going to keep his commandments. And there are things that we've not yet tapped into that are in Jesus if we just love him. 
See, it's about believing in Jesus as the Christ and the resurrection, but it's also about how we understand Jesus as the Christ. Because when we understand all what the Bible says about him, it's going to impact the way we live our lives. It will govern our obedience to the word of God. When we know him to be the son of the living God, we will live like he is. He says, I am the resurrection of life. I am the resurrection and the life. This is Christ speaking into something dead, speaking into a situation that seems far too gone. I've had time and time again in my life, and many of you have as well, you wondered how you were going to get through that circumstance. But today you stand here, you're in church today victorious, and you can look back and you can see it was God that brought me through those difficult circumstances, and I stand here today victorious because of the hand of God. Somebody give him praise. Death, Sister Sonia saying, could not hold you. What a powerful name it is. See, Lazarus died because we live in a fallen world, a sinful fallen world. And bodily pains and struggles are for the purpose of turning our attention to the one who can take care of us in the middle of that. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then there's that stilled personality. And Jesus come to the Marthas, that stilled personality, Mary. She's just, every time Jesus finds her, she is sitting and Jesus says, go get your sister, Martha. And Martha goes, I'll go get her. She comes to Mary and says, the, the master, the teacher wants to see you. Obediently she comes, but she sits and she waits. How many have difficulties doing that? You sit and you wait. I don't even mess with drive throughs at fast food. That right there is an oxymoron. Fast food. And then you mess with the drive through it should say slow food, and it's going to be wrong every time. If I'm going to pull off the road and get something at a fast food restaurant, I don't even mess with the drive through because my order's going to be wrong. Then I'm going, to get, I'm going to get aggravated. I'm going to have anger issues. I'm going to have to pray for God to forgive me of the, the hard feelings that I got in my heart for those people that I don't even know. Now, I know I'm not by myself this morning. So I pull into a parking place and I go in and order and I'll check my bag before I leave. Mary had that steeled personality. She waited. She didn't mind sitting and waiting for Jesus. Sister Ronnie, I had this memory of Alec the other day. We would have prayer times, Brother Brandon, on Sunday nights. And as Alec always did, he would wear a nice shirt, a pair of cargo shorts. He was the only person in this church that walked like Jesus walked because he had come in in sandals every week. And Alec would come in and he would kneel right over there. And for an hour, Alec would be on his knees praying. Now, again, I'm that Martha. I started kneeling, but I had to get up and start walking around. I had to start walking around and, and carrying my notes and carrying my prayer list because I keep kneeling like that. I'm going to fall asleep. And he would pray. He had a merry personality. I'm just going to wait here. The Bible says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So Jesus will come to us, whether we've got a Martha personality or a Mary personality, he comes to us right where we are. This next point I think is very important for us to get, and this is the third point. Jesus is not bound by our events, and he's not bound by time.
He is not bound by events and he's not bound by time. John 11, 24 through 26, 26, Martha said, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Listen, I know he will rise in, in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? He asked the question. Listen to what she says. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection. That's an event. At the last day. That's a time. And we try to pinpoint God and draw a circle around him and say, God, this is how I want you to do it. And this is when I want you to do it. And God says, my ways are past finding out. You can't put me in a box. You can't put me on a shelf. I'm God, Jehovah. I created the heavens and the earth just by the voice of my mouth. And you, we can't put God in a box. And so we get aggravated. We get frustrated. We quit following him. We walk the other direction when God doesn't do it the way. And, and we have an entitled mentality where uh, I'm going to push the microwave button and when I do, God's going to give it to me the way I want it, when I want it. And God's not bound by events in time. So I know you will resurrect Lazarus in the resurrection. That's an event. I know you will do it at the last day. That's a designated time. And Jesus says, hold on a minute. Uh, I, I'm not worried. I'm not concerned. I'm not bound by uh, events. I'm not bound by time. I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life. In, in Revelation, Jesus testifies of him, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. The Bible says he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And what he's telling me in those scriptures is in my yesterdays, all those things that we worry about that we wish we should have done, all those things we wish we had not done that plague us in our mind today, that those weights that we drag around about the faults and failures and sins and addictions we had from yesterday, that, but I want you to know God. God is in your yesterday and he has already taken care of that. So he wants you to have peace about it today. Give it to him. He wants to trade you, give you peace and forgiveness for all that stuff in the yesterday. Because he's not bound by time. And Jesus gives us the scenario, hey, don't worry about your tomorrows. There's enough worry in that today. And in the Lord's prayer, he said, give us this our daily bread. What is he saying? I'm the God of today and I'm going to take care of you today. Forget about the mess yesterday. I'm going to take care of you today. Don't worry about tomorrow. If you open up your eyes in heaven tomorrow, then it's all going to be all right anyway. So don't worry about tomorrow. Jesus isn't bound by events in time. He's not bound by our circumstances. He's not bound by the struggles we go through. There's nothing you and I deal with that scares God. There's nothing. Sister Joanne, he knows right where you are. And it is our job. He asked the question, do you believe? Sister Joanne, I'm telling you, I believe. He's going to move. Say, Brother J.D., that's nuts. Yes, it is. But he said, I am the resurrection and the life and the life and the life. And I think somebody here today, you need, you remember that phrase people used to say, and it was a cut down, but they look at you and say, hey, you need to get a life. Somebody needs to get a life, and I'm not putting you down, and that life is in Jesus. He said, I've come that you might have life, and that you may have it more abundantly. Quit living where you are, because he's got something bigger and better for you today. Amen? Give him praise. Yes. And finally, your miracle, your miracle is always for a higher purpose. In John chapter 11, verse 4, I'm going to read that. He said, His sickness will not end in death, but it's for the glory of God, and it's so that the Son of God may be glorified to, through it. But then he also, I'm going to read these verses of Scripture a little later on in John chapter 11. So they removed the stone. Jesus is standing at the uh, the 
the tomb of Lazarus. They remove the stone. They look, Lord, he's been dead four days. And he starts to pray. He says, Lord, God, I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary saw what he did and believed him. See, here's the thing. Don't misunderstand me. You know, the Lord wants to heal you. The Lord wants to redeem you this morning. The Lord wants to restore. He wants to raise you up. He wants to bring abundance to your life. He wants to bring prosperity to your life. But here's the thing. He always has a much bigger, better plan than just our comfort. It ain't just when he does a miracle in my life, that miracle ain't just for me. I know that's not good vernacular, but my miracle is not just for me. It is for other people. He wasn't trying to make Mary and Martha feel better. He wasn't just wanting to stop the flow of tears or the reality of their loss. We find that when Jesus does what he does, it is for the glory of God. It is to draw people's attention to him. It is to cause others to believe in his name. Amen. I don't want anyone to leave here today and not believe. Our standard Easter service is usually preaching on the resurrection of Jesus. I know that. Now, I thank you for being here today and sharing in our worship. But this was a divine intersection for me and you today. This isn't just another common Sunday and Easter service. It is a time where God reached into your life and stirred you up. And somehow, some way, you got to church today. It is for me to tell you, God wants to move in your life in a fresh, new way. It's for the glory of God. It's so that the Son of God may be glorified in your life. Verse 45 says, many of the Jews believed. Many of the Jews believed. Let me, let me tell you what the power in that, that statement, many of the Jews believed. The power in that statement the Jews who raised in Judaism, Abraham as our father, we live according to the Old Testament law. We follow the sacrificial uh, process of our sins being remitted because of a lamb or a dove. We go to the priest and confess. But because of this miracle, all of that tradition, all of that religion that never brought them into relationship with God went out the window because many believed in Jesus. Jesus asked the question, and so I ask you today, do you believe? Do you believe? Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those that believe, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Let me go back through these four real quick. The Lord's delay is not his denial. He's still going to move. You just wait on him. Jesus will meet you right where you are. No matter what your personality is like, no matter what you're struggling with or going through, he will meet you there. Jesus isn't bound by your events, by your circumstances or time. And understand this, the miracle that you experience is not just for you, it's bigger than you. Would you stand to your feet?
Jesus answers. But Jesus, through your love and your grace and mercy, you raised him up anyway. And God, there's some here, they probably don't even know how to ask. But God, I know you love them so much, you want to touch them anyway. So God, I believe the Holy Spirit can prompt and lead their words that they can say what they need from you. And God, you hear their heart and you're going to touch them right now. God, I believe you're in this place and you are moving, you're answering the prayer and you're comforting the heart. You're forgiving the sin. You're restoring a life. God, you are bringing resurrection to a dead situation. And God, I give you praise for it. I honor you. I know you have heard our prayer today. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. Can I ask you, would you, let's give God an ovation of praise by just putting our hands together. You folks look so great today. It is so good to have you in the house of the Lord. And I know next week is not Easter, but we want to ask you, come back. Join us in worship. Uh, I heard one pastor say, at, at, at my church, we'll treat you so many different ways, you're bound to like some of them. So thank you for being here. Let us pray. Father, we give honor to your name. We lift you up. We praise you that you have joined us as we've lifted you up, God. Your, your presence has been real. You have touched us at the point of our need. I believe, God, you have just moved in such a powerful way. God, that folks are going to leave here today transformed by your awesome power. God, I pray that you would keep us as we travel today. Lord, as we travel, I ask you to keep us safe as we spend time with our families today with each Easter supper, Easter lunch, that we'll have a great time. God, I worship and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.